Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 17. Hear the word of God, beginning in verse 6. And, and let me preface this reading by saying, here Jesus is saying a prayer. His disciples are surrounding him so, so they can hear what he's praying. He's praying for them. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me. And they have obeyed your word. Now they know everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They know with certainty that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in this world no longer, but they are still in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that the scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now that I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy. I have given them your words, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one, they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As, I, as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them, I sanctify myself, and they too will be sanctified. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray. Well, we lift up this prayer of, of Jesus to you and ask that you would open up our eyes to understand the depths of its truths. Psalm 1 also, Lord, the reading from the Old Testament, Lord, grant us spiritual insight so that we might take your word and receive it deeply within our hearts. May our hearts be good soil on which it is planted so that it, it might take root and grow and transform our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thomas Jefferson, in our Declaration of Independence, penned these words. All men are created equal and independent, that from that equal creation they derive rights inherent and inalienable, among which are the preservation of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So clearly our forefathers believed that the pursuit of happiness was important to the citizens of this nation. Interesting though, most people discover that happiness is fleeting. It, it's here for a short while and then suddenly it's gone. It alights upon your shoulder like a butterfly and then you reach for it and you try to capture it, but it flies away. Now if you took a poll, most Americans, I'm guessing that the consensus or the definition of happiness would be something like this. Doing what you want to do whenever you want to do it. Doing what you want to do whenever you want to do it. Well, perhaps the reason happiness is so elusive to so many people is because they embrace this definition. How many of us get to do what we want to do when we want to do it? Not many. And those who do do that aren't always happy. They may keep themselves entertained. They may go on an unending vacation if they have the ability to do that, constantly pursuing fun and pleasure. 
But still, that's not tantamount to happiness. Often the people who are living those lives are just trying to fill up a hole with that entertainment and, and those pleasures. If the fault is in the definition, if happiness isn't doing what you want to do whenever you want to do it, then what is happiness? Well, maybe it's not about you, and maybe it's not about me and pursuing our selfish interests. Perhaps happiness is being on the crest of that wave of God's purpose for your life and for my life. Think about it. If God created us, if God gave us life, then surely God has a purpose for you. And God has a purpose for me. I believe that purpose is dynamic. Now what do I mean by that? See, that's why I, I think it's like being on the crest of a wave. When something is dynamic, there's constant motion, activity, adjustments, variables, changes to be applied. Like a surfer trying to, to ride on that big wave, he adjusts his balance, senses the flow of the water below him, alters his position on that board, and at times one must make major shifts to maintain his balance and keep himself on the edge of that crest. If he becomes careless or apathetic or out of tune with that dynamic process, the power and the rush of the wave would overwhelm him and plunge him into the depths. To me, that's what this relationship with God is like. Now, we'll be heading to the ocean here in a few weeks. One of our favorite activities is bodyboard surfing. Has anyone ever in here that has ever bodyboard surfed? Wow. <laughs> Bill, you bodyboard surf. So you know what I'm talking about. This is how you do it. You have one of these styrofoam boards. It's so, so tall. You traipse out into the ocean 40, 50 yards, and you wait right where the big waves are crashing. And you wait for that big wave to come along. And when that big wave comes along, you know, the water kind of goes out. And it's up to here. And then it goes out and it goes down to your knees. And you get ready because that wave's about ready to break. And right when that wave starts to break, you jump up into the air with that bodyboard, land on the crest of that wave, hold on to that board, keep yourself balanced as best you can, and ride that wave, if you are successful, all the way into the shore until it crashes there on the beach. If you succeed in doing that, you get this feeling of great exhilaration that you've made it in. When I read Psalm 1, this is the analogy that comes to my mind. As I try to grasp the conditions described by the psalmist, that's what I see. He said, blessed or happy or joyful. It's kind of a combination of those words. Blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of mockers, but his delight is in God's word. And on God's word, he meditates. He takes it in. He thinks about it. He connects to it day and night. So according to the psalmist, the, the, the blessed person, the happy person, whether he's sitting or standing or, or walking, is spiritually in tune with what God is saying, with God's righteousness, with God's justice, with God's love, all those things that make up God. He doesn't want to lose his balance spiritually and get swept off that wave because he knows how quickly he could be fallen to the depths of the wickedness that surrounds him. He knows how easy it is to slip off that crest and get caught in the riptide of bad behavior, sinful behavior. He knows that he loses his focus and gets easily distracted. He could begin to listen to those voices that mock God, that mock the life of faith. So instead, he tunes his ears to God's Word, to what the Spirit is speaking deeply to his heart. He knows that the true and tried life principles found in God's Word will guide his life. 
Show him how to live righteously. Show him how to love people and care for people. How to promote justice and, and equality among people. Supporting those who are poor or who have been unjustly treated by society. Therefore, the happiness he seeks or the blessedness he seeks is maintained on this crest of this connection to God. The world and its ways are distracting, very sensational out there. The world is it's very sensual in all it does, offers materialism, offers like the self-indulgent life. The world shouts out in its promotions, its sales pitch about all of these things that are going on, but the person in this God zone strives to keep a balance and a stability and a focus as he listens to God's word as spoken by the Spirit to the heart. The psalmist says the one who does this puts on this bulletproof happiness. The force field is turned on. He compares this person who is maintaining his connectedness with, with God to a strong tree. He says he's like a tree planted by streams of water which yields fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither, and whatever he does, he prospers. What a wonderful, productive, well-grounded state to be in. Now the New Testament and Jesus teaches this same principle, this same truth to his disciples. Jesus wants them to, to abide in this very spiritually focused state, beginning in John 15, 6. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be given you. Jesus said that as soon as a person loses focus and strays from that relationship with God and is drawn away to the trivial things of the world or the sensational things of the world, that person is like a, a branch that, that has died on the tree and it's going, to, it's going to be cut off. The force field is down, the bulletproof vest is off. That person becomes vulnerable to the slings and arrows of this world around him. But the person who remains in the vine and abides in him keeps in tune with the teachings of Jesus, the tried and true principles of the words of God, and produces much fruit. The sap that flows through the tree reaches the branches and produces the fruit as we are connected into Christ the flow of the Spirit goes into our lives and produces that fruit. Sometimes we stumble, sometimes we stray. When we do, we know it, because we, we can sense that the fruit of God in our lives has stopped being produced. And so we come back to the Lord, recommit ourselves, and the fruit begins to grow again. Jesus says something else here that's very interesting. Fascinating. He said, the person who remains or abides in me, the person who hears my words and abides in my words, that person can ask whatever they want and, and I will give that to them. Now, an unspiritual person immediately casts these words into the light of his own selfish desires. He says, you mean I can ask Jesus for a Cadillac and he'll give me a Cadillac? I can ask Jesus for a million dollars and he'll give me a million dollars? No, that's not what Jesus is talking about here. The Lord is saying that as you plant yourself in a relationship with God and begin growing and, and, and that sap of the Spirit begins flowing in your life, what happens is you begin to desire what God desires. That your will and God's will begins to coincide, and so you begin to want the things that God wants, and of course, 
God is going to empower you to achieve those things. God is going to open up your eyes to that possibility, to that potential, and then empower you to move in that direction. And that is an exciting way of life. Moving in that direction, which maybe you thought once was impossible, but with God's power in your life leading you, moving in that direction to see it become a reality. Before Jesus went to the cross, he tried to instill this mindset in his disciples. He knew his life on earth was limited. Soon he would die. He raised from the dead and then ascended into heaven. Here in John 17, surrounded by his disciples, he said this prayer, knowing that they were listening to every word. He said to the Father, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still here in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. For they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is that you don't take them out of the world, but rather that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of this world, even as I am of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. First, he asked the Father that his followers would have that full measure of joy. Jesus wanted us to have this bulletproof happiness, this bulletproof joy. He wanted them to learn to ride at the, the crest of this connectedness to God with ears attuned to the voice of the Spirit, focused on the path of God's will in front of them. He wanted them to be focused so much on this relationship that the world wouldn't draw them away and make them stumble and fall and plunge back into the depths. That was important to Jesus because he knew that he was going to send them back out into the world to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. That is important for us to understand. The reason God wants us to have this growing relationship, we are the ones out in society who bring the light of Christ and the love of Christ to those who don't understand it yet. It, it's God's power changing our lives, transforming us, bringing that love into this world that impacts those who are looking for God. Who are thinking, this, this world isn't all there is. Jesus said that despite the world's animosity toward believers, Father, don't take these followers out of the world. They are the salt and the light of this earth. They need to be here. They need to shine forth in the darkness. They need to bring righteousness. They need, they need to bring healing. They need to bring hope. They need to bring life to a world that's in trouble. Jesus said, Father, keep them in this world, but protect them. Give them my joy that will help them make it through. Set them apart for this mission of being the salt and light that society so desperately needs. This morning we need to hear this prayer of Jesus, for He also prayed this prayer for us. The Lord wants us to have that kind of joy. Jesus desires that our lives be shaped and transformed and empowered by the Spirit by the living Word of God. And when we do, we will become the light. And we will become the salt this world so desperately needs. Amen. Let's turn to our final hymn. Number 536. Happy to home.